All right, welcome everyone to the Penn Ultimate RTD Accountability Committee meeting on June 28th, 2021. I'm sure you all share my excitement about seeing the light shining brightly at the end of the tunnel. Hopefully, um, Rut will get his um, camera fixed, but meanwhile, we'll go ahead and um, dive into the uh, um, agenda. So um, we'll start off with public comment and we've allotted up to 20 minutes for this and each speaker will be uh, have up to three minutes to talk to us about what's on their mind. Um, Melinda, is there anybody who has raised their hand uh, to indicate a desire to speak to us this morning? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm looking now. Um, I guess we can give them just a few minutes to see if there's any virtual hands that need to be raised. Okay. And remind, uh, um, what do they need to do if they're on the phone and want to speak? Uh, we don't currently have anyone on the phone, but just for the record, if someone does call in, they just need to hit star nine to star raise nine. your hand. Wonderful. You would think I would remember that by now, but. <laughs> um, and actually at this time, I, I still don't see any hands raised. Okay, well, in that case, then um, we, why don't we uh, just hold that open for a minute to see if anybody um, shows up because other people may have technical difficulties as well and move on to our June 14th meeting summary. Um, if folks had a chance to look that over, did anybody have any um, needed edits or comments on that? Or well, we can accept that. I'm not seeing any, so we'll uh, uh, accept that meeting summary then and move on to the co-chair report. Let me ask my fellow co-chair if she has anything to report, Crystal? I do not at this time, thank you. I guess the one thing I would report that we, um, Crystal and I made one final presentation uh, to the, um, Mo uh, it was basically the committee um, mobility for all committee um, in Boulder County, which um, works on a lot of um, equity mobility issues. And we gave them a presentation on um, our final recommendations and they gave us our, their feedback, which was largely focused on supporting the idea of having more local input into uh, local transit decisions and um, supporting the, the recommended changes to the fares and passes, particularly making it easy for um, folks to income qualify and, and get the live benefits. So I'll just enter that summary into the record. And with that, I think we're ready to uh, turn it over to RTD to get a brief update on things from RTD. Who is going to take that report for us? So I'd be happy to jump in, Madam there Chair. There you are. The Wonderful, thank you, yeah, CEO so, Johnson. Yes, yeah, so good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all. So a couple of things that are happening on our front. Um, as you all are probably aware, we have engaged with a myriad of different audiences as we look to embark upon a fair study and equity analysis. We're really trying to garner input and understand people's pain points as we use that information that we gather from a multitude of different um, avenues to leverage the scope in which we will solicit uh, to go forward to have a robust in depth fair equity um, analysis as well as a study. And we have a meeting that's forthcoming on um, June 30th, actually um, on Wednesday. Additionally, uh, working in tandem with the board of directors uh, have been creating alignment around what we uh, anticipate our success outcomes. It's really a laser-like focus on our organization holistically in the sense of creating a mission, a vision and values. And basically with the success outcomes, it enables me as a leader of this organization to work and manage expectations from the greater public as well as the board as we discern what activities, i.e. key performance metrics and so forth that will enable us to yield our success outcomes that will revolve around community value, um, customer excellence, uh, financial success, as well as employee ownership. Um, and additionally, what we've been in the throes of as well, utilizing information 
uh, that we had collected through our service equity analysis relative to impacts of COVID-19 back in April really of 2020 when we uh, decreased service due to the residual impacts of said pandemic. We're using the service equity analysis as a guidepost as we go forward, looking to um, add back service uh, without creating a disproportionate or dis disparate impact on minority populations and low income populations. And so that's um, underway as well as we have public meetings and go forward to look at adding back some critical elements of service in the September timeframe. Um, working in tandem as well with our partners at the Amalgamated Transit Union as well. Um, so we have flexibility should we monitor and um, uh, see the need to add service prior to a specific uh, designated uh, service change stipulated by the CBA. So that's what I've had this morning for all of you and thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Thank you, CEO Johnson. Are there any questions for um, RTD? I think I see Dea. Yep. Sorry, I was trying to find the actual raise hand function, so I apologize. Um, uh, Deborah, I'm just kind of curious. You mentioned that there was a meeting on the 23rd. I'm assuming that's an internal RTD me meeting around the fair study, or can you? Oh, no, I misspoke. If you heard the 23rd, I actually said, or, so I, the thought 30th. I, said <laughs> I thought I said the 30th. No, that's that's an external meeting. That'll be virtual and there's information and I could get that to you. I'm sure one of my staff, I see Bill Saroy here um, and have more specifics. I know I'm supposed to be there and I can look at my calendar really quickly and tell you the exact time if you just indulge me for a quick second. Oh, it's not the 30th. I said the wrong day. Somebody needs to help me with the day. I think it's July. Oh. RTD staff to the rescue. I've misspoke, but I know it's forthcoming. <laughs> so okay. I will I will get clarification. Oh, Bill Soroy is raising his hand. So if he could clarify, I've misspoke for sure. It's June 30th and Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pauletta Tonell has just sent me an email. <laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah, yeah, it's it's a telephone town hall and it is uh, you know gonna be open to the public, so it'll be uh, Wednesday at six to, from six to seven. Great. Thanks for that clarification. Yes, um, thank you. Any other questions for RTD? All right, I think I'll turn it over to my co-chair to run the discussion items today. If, if you're ready to do that, Crystal. Yes, thanks, Elise. All right, we are gonna transition into a briefing on the survey data and public comment. And I'll let Dr. Cog staff jump in. Good morning, uh, Matthew Helfant, Senior Transportation Planner, Dr. Cog. I have my colleague, Lisa Hood, our Public Engagement Planner uh, here with me and um, we are going to update you on uh, public comments uh, received and also uh, the survey results and analysis. So uh, next slide. And so um, we've actually received several uh, um, comments and uh, uh, the, the survey was taken by uh, over 430 uh, participants and just wanna thank the the, the committee uh, for members and, and other stakeholders for, uh, for doing a really good job promoting the survey. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Lisa. Thanks, Matthew. Good morning, everybody. So you all remember from your previous meeting on June 14th, we gave you a preview of the public input that we had received so far. But the survey was open an additional two days after we met with you. So we wanted to give you an overview of everything that we heard, as well as really dive into some of the written comments that we were hadn't analyzed yet by the time of the June 14th meeting. So as Matthew mentioned, we had 433 responses to the survey. So that was about 40 additional responses that we received after you got the presentation at the June 14th meeting. And just looking at who those respondents were, about 80% of people said that they would consider themselves a transit user. 
So just keep that in mind with the survey results. The survey is not a statistically valid um, survey. It's really a engagement tool and a way to get feedback from people. So just try to think about that. When we say survey, we don't mean scientific survey. It's really a feedback tool. Um, but great to see that 80% of people are transit users and giving that perspective. And then looking at the geographic distribution of our respondents, um, we got somebody from every single county in the Dr. Cog region, so that's great. Um, there was the most respondents from Denver, Boulder, and Arapaho, um, but overall fairly representative of kind of the proportions in the region, maybe slightly more people from Boulder and Denver than uh, the proportions in the region, but not much. Um, and overall, really, the, as you would have seen in your packet, there was strong support for all of the recommendations that were provided. There was just kind of varying levels of that, um, the agreement with the recommendation. So I'm gonna walk you through each of those. If you went to the survey, you know that the format of the survey was kind of a quick summary of each of those recommendations. And then respondents also had the ability to look at the full set of recommendations and give additional feedback on that as well. And for those summaries of each topic, there was also an opportunity for people to provide written responses. And that's where we're gonna really add more detail than what you heard at the last meeting because we were able to dig into those. It was over a thousand written comments that we got through those. So I'm gonna provide a quick high level um, kind of common themes that we heard in the written ones for each, each of the topics. So I'm gonna start with governance. This was really about the sub-regional service councils. And high level majority of respondents agreed with the recommendation to create those sub-regional service councils. You can see about three quarters of people either strongly agreed or agreed. Like I said, there were varying levels of support for each of the recommendations. This is one of the, the recommendations that had a few more people on that strongly disagree or disagree side. And so digging into the written comments and what we heard for that, um, you know, we heard really strong support in the written comments for having more local input integrated. But there were some comments about the councils maybe being unnecessary, adding another layer of bureaucracy, some references to issues with just the RTD board structure. And then there were some concerns raised about whether the recommendations of the council would truly impact decision making at RTD. And then overall, there were also some questions about just membership, who would be involved in the councils, how would they be chosen, how would the boundaries be set up in the organization of the councils? So those were really the common themes that we heard related to that one. Next, we asked about operations, and that was really focused on the fees and pass programs. And most of the respondents said they strongly agree with the idea of simplifying the fee and pass programs. This was actually the one with this, the most number of people that said they strongly agreed with the recommendations. Um, there were some concerns in the written comments about the, um, the proposal to assess employers um, for transportation fees, but there were also comments uh, expressing support for that idea. Um, general support for simplification of fees. There were lots of people put in examples of different fee structures from other cities to look at. Um, and then some just, we, we also got a mixed bag about comments about free fares. So some people for, some people against. Um, so a little bit of everything in that one. For the service delivery recommendations, this question was set up a little bit differently where we displayed several different strategies and asked people to rate their agreement on that. And so there was really high respondent agreement with all of these strategies, generally higher than all of the other recommendations that were tested. There were a lot of comments in the written section, um, really talking about emphasizing the need to improve service, improving user experience and safety. There was some differing opinions in the written comments about whether RTD should be focused on those existing frequent riders, increasing overall ridership, or really focusing on people with disabilities um, and improvements there. A lot of people acknowledge the importance between, or the important link between land use and transportation, but there were some questions raised about whether that's RTD's role or local government role, um, just some topics uh, discussed there. Lots of things about first and last mile connections and improving that, especially by bike. Um, and then just generally focus on service improvements like availability, frequency, reliability, and how that would increase ridership. Um, and then getting to the North, Northwest Rail and Unfinished Fast Tracks recommendation. So most of our respondents 
So the survey agreed with the idea of focusing on bus rapid transit until there's adequate funding identified for the Northwest Rail Line. However, this is one of the ones where the recommendations was not quite as strong as some of the others. So you can see there were, there were about 15% of people that either disagreed or strongly disagreed. This one definitely had the most written comments um, in, included in this one. There were many commenters who expressed their support for bus rapid transit, lots of references to a lack of ridership or demand, which makes bus rapid transit a better solution in their mind. Um, but also many comments about the rail having been promised and that funding should be found to get it done. Um, other comments not specific to Northwest Rail about un other unfinished lines, geographic equity, things like that. And then some concerns were expressed about funding, funding the bus rapid transit maybe taking away some of the momentum or funding from the eventual rail. However, do you want to point out still uh, still at 73% of people agreeing or strongly agreeing with this one. Next up, we asked about COVID relief funding. Respondent agreement was very strong with this one. Again, one of the highest. Um, the comments that we heard were mostly supporting the focus on increasing ridership. Lots of comments about the need to restore service. Lots of location specific comments like um, about which routes needed to be restored. Um, and then a lot of comments actually included about recommendations related to RTD employees. So hiring incentives, retaining workforce, recruiting and increased wages came up a lot in the written comments. And then there were, there were several comments about whether this recommendation was necessary, whether there are already requirements tied to the funding that would maybe mean that this recommendation wasn't, um, wasn't necessarily uh, required. Next up, we had uh, recommendations related to partnerships. This was another one where we displayed several different strategies. Um, it was, the agreement was pretty high with the idea of piloting first and last mile solutions to build ridership, fairly high about incentivizing communities for those um, cost sharing agreements, a little bit lower for the other strategies. And what we really heard in the written comments um, was a lot of skepticism or hesitation about partnering with private companies um, and then just generally saying, people saying that RTD should be focused on service restoration and improvements related to partnerships. The last one was related to transparency and reporting. Um, this was another one that was very strong. A lot of people said they strongly agreed with it. Um, a great deal of support for this one. Lots of support in the written comments. Some people thinking that this information is already available. So this recommendation maybe is less necessary. And then Again, coming back to a focus on service improvement um, and really wanting to focus on that rather than putting a lot of focus on funding something like this. So those were the, the main topics that we summarized in the survey and asked for responses on. Like I said, we also provided links to the full set of recommendations to ask people what they thought about the full set where there's a lot more detail. And we got a lot of really wide ranging comments for that. So I really encourage you to take a look at the appendix in your packet if you want to learn more about what people said. Um, but kind of the common themes that came out of those that we saw was just the need to focus on improving service. That was something that was in every single question and also related to this full set of recommendations. So really focus on service. Um, also lots of support expressed for the recommendations, but some questions were raised about how they would be funded or implemented. And then we received several questions in the written comments about why there were no recommendations for changes to the board structure. So a lot of um, just curiosity about why that didn't come up as part of the recommendations. So that's really the summary of what we heard. I can provide any more detail or an answer any questions that you might have. As you know, we've also received public input in um, several different ways because we had the public hearing at your June 14th meeting, the, um, the, 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 the summary of that is in your meeting minutes. Um, also there, like I said, there's a thousand written responses. Those are all provided in the public input summaries appendix. And then we received several emails directly. So those are also in the appendix for you to take a look at. But that, that is all I have for you this morning. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and thank you all for all of your work. I, I can imagine having to comb through all of the testimony. Um, so thank you. Um, I just want to pause and see if there's anyone on the committee who might want to 
um, address any of the um, of the summary that was given. I know there was a specific comment related to the um, oh, apologies. Uh, Alrighty, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I know there was a comment related to um, our governance governance subcommittee related to um, the lack of a specific recommendation. I wonder, Julie, if you'd be willing to just give a, a summary of um, why for folks who haven't joined us throughout this process and maybe just joining today. Yeah, and so the conversation that happened in the governance subcommittee was, um, you know, we we talked a lot about what was the problem we were trying to solve, especially with the RTD board of directors and recommendations around that. And really what came down, it came down to the conversation of there are so many working parts going on right now with RTD, right? So they have a new general manager. Um, RTD reimagine is currently taking place, not to mention also our recommendations are coming out. So it was something that we felt needed to be addressed perhaps after a period of time when all of these moving parts kind of settled and the dust kind of settled at that point. Um, and then that's something that we could or something that, that should be looked at um, at a later point. Not to mention also that the RTD board of directors themselves have already implemented or and plan on implementing things um, of how they do their work. So for example, their committee structure and things like that. So it really was just a matter of so many different moving parts um, working in tandem that we felt that a recommendation on that area um, probably was, was something that was, <laughs> was gonna be a little tough for us to make at this time. Um, Jackie, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to that? My hand was raised to make a make an oh, overarching okay. comment. So okay. but sorry, I wasn't I, I was I wanted to talk about kind of something Rut had brought up in an email, but okay. So, so but, but the only other thing given the opportunity, you know me, uh no, I was just gonna say I think we could strengthen the language about that. I think you summarized it beautifully. And that was um there were so many things that we were taking a look at right now and so many moving pieces associated with it, and it was referenced in the document. But I do think we could strengthen that language um, about kind of we said in two years, take a look at it. Maybe we just firm that up a little bit more. Um, but when once you move off of this, I do have comments about something else. So. Thank you, Jackie. I'll just pause and see if anyone had any additional comments on that particular um, theme. I'm not seeing anyone. Besides you, Jackie, so you can, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the mic. You, sorry, sorry. my unmute button wasn't working. Um, I, I, um, I, as I read Rutt's email this morning about um, the survey results and how things were characterized, and then Lisa's really good explanation about that this really wasn't a statistically significant survey, that it was an engagement feedback tool. I'm wondering if we should call it something else because um, I don't think anybody's gonna read the asterisks associated with the survey and it was only 433 people and it was really three counties. Um, I'm wondering if we should try and make the, the title of the document, more, you know, a feedback tool, public engagement tool versus a survey because I think people are gonna start quoting it um, like it is a statistically significant survey and that this is what the recommendations were. And I think even some of the comments that Rut made kind of were along those lines were like, well, wait a minute, this isn't exactly that. So I guess I wanted to um, just throw that out for the body to see if there's another name we could use for that document. Does anyone have any input uh, related to Jackie's comment? Go ahead, Elise. I, I think um, Rutt's email and Jackie's comments are both relevant. Um, I think it is important to recognize it's not statistically significant. These are people that voluntarily decided to, to provide their comments. Um, that said, they were overwhelmingly positive. And while staff understandably tried to parse out which ones only got three quarters versus almost 90%, um, basically overwhelmingly folks 
liked our stuff. So I, I, I think both of those comments would be relevant to incorporate in the final draft. If, if I could uh, just add a little bit to that, it really was a wonderful response in terms of how positive it was about the ideas that have come out of the committee. And, and uh, I'd hate to see that sort of overshadowed by this was light in this area or this was whatever. And, and it isn't statistically significant, but it does reflect the mood of, you know, 450 people out there or so. And so I, I think, uh, I think it is a good public engagement tool. I don't think it's a statistically significant survey until, unless it was done in, in different ways, but it is a good, uh, a good temperature of uh, what people thought of some of the ideas that came out of the committee. That's all. Thank Could you. I just add, it's not just, if you refer to public engagement writ large and the survey is just a tool of that, you could add up the, the oral testimony we received, the written emails, the survey responses, um, the responses to presentations we gave you, put it all in that bucket and the results were similar across the board in, in terms of generally being supportive. There were a few suggestions and tweaks and absolutely, but by and large supportive. So I think characterizing it in that, in that way um, would make sense. I think uh, some really good points made. Uh, does anyone have an objection to uh, moving forward um, and directing our team to make changes to that effect? Great. Hey, Crystal, I guess the, the also wondering about any potential changes to the language associated with the, the revisiting of the board structure. Um, is that something that we want to talk about or are we just going to? Yeah, I'm happy to bring that back up. Julie, Jackie, you, you know, do you think it'd be best if we um, added some strengthening more or more clarity in the language we've used in the uh, body of the report? Yeah, I agree with Jackie's comments on that. I think that um, adding strength to that um, would be beneficial. Um, it was in, it was a very um, important conversation for our subcommittee and something that, although we, we weren't really able to come up with a recommendation, something that was a, a very large concern, I think, for a lot of the members of the subcommittee. So I think, um, you know, strengthening that, I think, could be really helpful um, in the long term. So yeah, and I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to think of specific suggestions here. Go ahead, Elise. I guess I wanted to ask a process question. Um, I think the, the last discussion item is to go through the draft recommendations and, and talk about all potential changes. So I'm wondering if we shouldn't do that all, all at once rather than just picking up this one, because I think there's others related maybe to Northwest Rail, a timeline for implementation, other things that came up. So if I guess I would propose we parking lot this this particular conversation, see if there's any other comments on public uh, feedback, and then get to, to all the potential changes at once. Thanks, Elise. Um, I'd like to wrap up this conversation. Actually, um, I think it's we're talking about it now. Um, and just a couple of things I wanted to just resolve. I, you know, I, I hear you on the process piece. Um, and I would love to just open it up again, but you know, it seems kind of odd to have opened the conversation and not, I guess, close it out um, in the same uh, moment, I guess. Um, so I guess I'll just ask a similar question to the last comment. Is there any opposition in taking another look, um, Julie and others giving uh, some guidance on uh, what that language could look like to add more clarity? Um, on that particular recommendation. What's the recommendation to, to, to make it stronger? We basically said, look at it in a couple of years after you've implemented our recommendations. Are you suggesting that this is an important topic? We really want you to look at it in two years. What would, or are you suggesting changing our recommendation? Because No, I, I don't think I, the conversation was ever about changing the recommendation, Elise. Um, I think the conversation, stemmed out of 
and this is the, you know, I'm using the, the feedback from that presentation around uh, at being unclear or just comments related to that specific recommendation. Um, so I, I'm trying to be responsive of what the, the public has interpreted and the comments from the committee today were about potentially making it more clear and I don't have that language in front of me. So, um, you know, generally I don't think that the recommendation will change and uh, if we can strengthen that language, I didn't see an issue with asking for support moving forward there. And I'm not sure we would get to that exact language during this meeting. Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, exactly what you're doing, Crystal, and I think it's important to be responsive. I guess I was directing that to Jackie on what were you suggesting for language changes? Because I think we need to give staff a little bit more targeted direction, because I'm not sure exactly what would be helpful here. Yeah, th thanks, Elise. I, I do feel that there was an expectation that this was going to be able to be further explored. At least that was my expectation when uh, from a year ago, but we really didn't even have an opportunity to have a real thorough discussion about this until in the in the committee until I would say late April at best, early May. And so I don't think we gave it the time and attention that we were able to give to something like the service councils. And I also recognize, and I thought um, Julie summarized it beautifully, is that there were so many moving parts associated with it, and the uh, directors were making their own changes in how they were uh, you know, working through board processes and subcommittees and implementing those. And so um, it, it, it's just that it's following a reasonable period of, I mean, I'm pulling up the language, following a reasonable period of time for the committee recommendations to be implemented, investigate the effectiveness. Maybe we just come out just a little bolder and say um, in two years, explore the effectiveness of any changes and recommendations that were made in this process and determine if it makes sense to do a more thorough deta detailed uh, uh, review of the board structure and just flat out say it instead of the qualifying language around it. That would be my recommendation. So the expectation to the public is that yes, this is something we know has been raised by a whole host of people there are some moving parts right now, but we're gonna give those parts two years to resolve themselves and then take a look at the effectiveness of the board. And that to me is a much more clear, straightforward um, recommendation than, than the way it's presented right now. Super helpful, I would support that. All right, any, go ahead, Julie. I was just gonna say, I think it aligns um, with the conversations that we had in the subcommittee meetings regarding this issue. So I, I completely support that. Okay, any objection to that change? Great. Alrighty, uh, so we talked specifically about uh, some of the feedback. Uh, I just wanna open it back up to the, the full uh, public input um, and give an opportunity for anybody to um, give a, an opinion or a comment on that as well. I have, I have some proposed changes based on public comment. If now is the time to start editing the document, then, then we can open that up. And I have a number of things, or I can wait till we get to talking about the draft recommendations. Okay. Um, if, okay, if we're talking, Looks sorry. Like Doug has his hand Yeah, up. I was gonna say, I think I see Doug. Go ahead, Doug. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, um, uh, to Lisa's point earlier, we, when we do go through the document, the last item, we have the ability to make changes in real time if we so desire to, to wordsmith some particular areas. So okay. uh, it would be my suggestion that we hold off um, having a comprehensive conversation on the recommendation until we get to, re to the report. That'll work. Um, I think that, I think kind of high level, I just, my comments on the, uh, on the, public comment, I'm really happy to see that we've had um, a large, what I would consider a large volume of public input in different um, forums. Uh, I am, I guess, just like overall a little disappointed that not as many folks took advantage of our public comment um, option during our ongoing meetings. I know that's not specifically 
related to um, any of the tools, but you know, in one way that was a structure that we set up to um, you know, allow for public feedback, uh, but I, I still think it was a good part of our process to have included that when um, it was available um, and, and when folks did take advantage of it. But, um, you know, obviously uh, overall still really happy to see uh, the volume of public feedback. And I see that Lynn has raised her hand. Go ahead, Lynn. Thanks. I think uh, just on the public comment, um, I think that there were there was a lot of good information there, but I, I would really support what Jackie and, and Rudd are saying, it, presenting this not as a survey, um, at the risk of, of pointing out what I think you all know, but is not clear in that, um, in the public engagement tool is that everything is a trade-off and you have to prioritize. And, you know, if you ask people, would you like free fares? we would all like free fares, right? And it's not to say that we won't be going there. You know, Deborah's starting this process. I'm not saying we're going to free fares, but Deborah's starting this process and the staff are starting this process and the board of looking at fares and passes and uh, equity interests. And, and uh, one concern I had with the public engagement tool is, uh, you know, it's just like, do you like this? Um, so I think the idea of, of changing the title at least is a, is a very good one, thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, since we've wrapped up those um, discussion points uh, that we started in this uh, section of our committee, uh, we can go ahead and move on to the next, uh, which is a briefing on our equity assessment. Good morning again. Um, so, uh, Dad, are you running the, uh, the slides? Okay, perfect. Hi. Just wait just a second for those to come up. All right. So um, next slide. Uh, so uh, as the committee members uh, know, uh, equity assessments, uh, assessments accompany each of the um, recommendations. And this was one of the first items that the committee worked on uh, uh, to develop a, a, a template uh, to evaluate each of the recommendations. And um, for the vast majority of the recommendations, uh, Dea Zavala and uh, Mile High Connects worked with the community uh, to, to go through and, and conduct the equity assessments. So I will turn it over to Dea. Great, thank you, Matthew. Um, hi everyone. I, first of all, just wanna acknowledge and thank the committee for offering this opportunity to bettering or to allow um, the community to better engage with this process. Um, just as some background, Mile High Connects convened uh, what we were calling an ad hoc equity work group, which consisted of uh, members of the community, including um, folks from Criminal Justice Reform, Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition, the FACTS Partnership, Denver Streets Partnership, Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, Colorado Fiscal Institute, Conservation Colorado, and then Growing Home, a nonprofit based in Adams County. And so each of these organizations um, convened as recommendations were coming out from the RTD Accountability Committee to apply the equity screen. And so I'm just going to hit on some high level um, points that the committee or that the, the working group, I should say, raised up. I've also asked Molly McKinley, who um, is on this call to join and as a member of the equity work group, just add additional context, um, just as she was a member of the committee and has, I think, a little bit uh, firmer grasp on really what was discussed. I also just wanna share that Mile High Connects hired an outside facilitator, someone that we've worked with closely to help convene and, and facilitate the process. Um, so while we as the staff um, at least participated, uh, it was really up to the community folks that we, we wanted them to engage in this process. So I am going to go through these. Um, I think I already gave you all this <laughs> overview. Um, one just reflection that I want to share about the equity assessment is that certainly for organizations that have participated in equity screens, this is not something that was new to them. However, engaging in this process so late in the game was certainly um, just a, a, a catch up point. So oftentimes we had to ground folks in the recommendations coming out of the committee to make sure that we all had common understanding 
of what was being discussed and, and how did the committee arrive at this point. So um, in terms of the fairs and uh, fair and past programs, a couple of things that were lifted up as far as equity concerns or things that we want to be aware of uh, were certainly around language access and literacy being kind of a critical uh, awareness building, especially when it comes to language justice and how folks um, are really uh, I guess experiencing, you could say, the, the fairs and the past structures. This was something that the committee uh, was very mindful of, or the working group, I should say, was really mindful of, um, and just being clear on how are all of RTD's past programs and structures communicated in a way that's uh, approachable and accessible by different folks in the community. Another just broad equity concern overall comment was around the impact on our smallest businesses um, and really thinking about what that might look like um, especially as part of uh, the recommendation. Um, there was some concern around the focus on um, eco passes, which raised a concern, especially for frontline employees that might not necessarily have an eco pass, at least in its current form. So just being mindful of how that shows up in the recommendation and ultimately in the implementation pieces. Um, the other just equity concern was that um, a recognition that large employers don't necessarily represent the most marginalized and transit dependent writers. So really, how does this, uh, how does this benefit get down to um, those that are most dependent on transportation? Um, the other equity concern that I just want to lift up, um, which I think was mentioned in the public comments, is really limiting the burden of proof on income qualified individuals, um, requiring low income individuals to provide proof of poverty. Um, is inequitable as employers aren't necessarily required to do the same. Um, and then I think just to lift up another, um, in terms of benefit, uh, certainly offering the free pass, which I think was mentioned in the public comments, um, from an equity perspective, that that was definitely something that the, the working group felt was very strong um, and provided a benefit in terms of equity. Um, especially since it helps to increase and support low-income writers and increase writership. So I'm going to pause for just a second to see if Molly has anything else that she might want to add at this point. I don't at this point. I just would echo your, your comments about making the fair and past structure as simple as possible for folks to navigate. Great. Thanks, Molly. Um, so moving forward on to the service delivery um, just again, want to hit some overall comments and, and um, points that were brought up by this equity work group. Um, most of the folks, again, are, are very uh, connected into community and really cognizant of uh, the role of, of equitable transit oriented development and just traditional TOD, transit oriented development and gentrification displacement. So um, this was something that was lifted up as equity as an equity concern um, for folks for, on this committee to, to consider. Um, as with other recommendations, um, they really encourage RTD to consider the impacts of displacement on low-income communities um, with the expansion and development around rail lines or transit lines in general. So what's the potential impact there? And then lifting up um, that a, a potential benefit, however, could be that working with uh, local municipalities and RTD to preserve affordability near transit could actually result in more equitable outcomes. Um, there was also, I think, a positive equity opportunity um, for RTD to promote its services. The working group certainly saw this as um, something that was really important and reaching out to broader different audiences. Again, going back to language justice and lifting up how is RTD communicating service delivery changes in the variety of different languages um, to ensure that uh, a variety of folks are actually receiving the information. The other comment that I will just lift up in terms of the equity concerns I think this came up in the um, public comments, if I remember correctly, uh, but being inclusive of people with disabilities throughout the work of the recommendation and really centering, um, you know, centering and, and working directly with folks that have disabilities to listen to and center their concerns. Um, that certainly has a ripple effects when it comes to equity, or at least that was the sentiment of this working group. Um, moving on into partnerships, there were a couple of things that came up in terms of equity and really just more so around definitions. Um, the location of anchor institutions and their role may actually lead to inequities in partnerships with low income communities. Um, that's just based on some historic um, relationships between anchor institutions, which have typically seemed very closed off to low income communities. Um, and so centering efforts around anchor institutions might actually 
um, create more inequities, but kind of finding that balance, I think was really something that lift, was lifted up by this community uh, group. The other thing is that um, very focused on definitions, <laughs> uh, providing some clear definition around what is an anchor institution would be very helpful in terms of equity. Um, because at the end of the day, anchor institution may not necessarily be perceived um, by, by folks in the community as like a big institution. It has a lot of different definitions. Um, the other uh, equity concern was around worker protections, um, really focusing on worker dignity. Uh, this uh, working group felt that recognizing the shift of service from RTD to mobility service providers can result in equity as well paid uh, equity concerns as well paid jobs transition to gig employment or gig economies and so from an economic standpoint or at least an economic equity um, we may actually be creating more inequities so just keeping that in mind and how do we find that balance um, the last equity concern that i'll just hit on is the expansion of partners um, again, getting back to the definitions, being really clear that when we're talking about institutions, we're also talking about schools and services that are providing um, organizations, I should say, that are providing some sort of service to the community and considering them as anchor institutions. Nonprofits really rooted in communities could be, um, could also be, uh, I, I would say, defined as an anchor. Um, Molly, I want to check in with you just to see if there's any additional things that I may have missed either in the partnerships or in the service delivery. I would just underscore that concern about worker protections in this piece. And I think even more broadly, just thinking about the impacts, not only on the folks who are providing the service with, you know, switching to different mobility providers rather than RTD, but then also just how does that impact service as well? You know, we know we can rely on our TD, um, but just thinking about different impacts of relying on for-profit companies um, to provide that type of service for us as well. Great, thank you, Molly. Um, so going on to the transparency and reporting, um, a couple of things to lift up, uh, just as was mentioned previously, language access, literacy, and accessibility are certainly equity concerns. So how are we making this information as approachable to, to different audiences? I think the audience, again, looking at the first bullet point, really came up as an equity um, concern or an equity consideration because it will affect um, who exactly we're trying to reach. So who is this designed for and are they included in the design process? So are we using some um, user-centered design to really make sure that it's getting to the folks that we need. Um, I think we heard in the public comment section that a lot of folks uh, felt like this information was out there, but ultimately making it approachable and digestible, I think was something that this equity working group really brought up. Um, the other just comment in terms of the um, dashboard is around, um, you know, that there's an increase on, or there's an increased focus on transparency by providing the dashboard but they also, the working group also recognized that timely updates are gonna be necessary and crucial to just make sure that the community is up to speed. Um, so really naming that, um, you know, ideally a staff member or someone needs to be um, in the implementation side, needs to be um, maintaining the dashboard just so that the community has most current information was something that the group felt was um, worth uh, mentioning in terms of equity, because again, if the, community isn't able to get timely information, then it doesn't serve its intended purpose. Um, and then the definitions of equity, that was certainly something that came up um, among this group. The working group noticed the broad sweeping definition of equity in the, met in the metrics. Um, the term equality is used, which is different than equity. And so it's important to define equity consistently. Um, it shows up a couple of different ways, at least within the recommendations. And so RTD may want to consider revising this along um, with including safety in terms of the definition of equity. So safety meaning personal safety as well. So those were again, some high level points. Molly, am I missing anything or anything else to add on the transparency? I don't think so, not here. Um, the last thing that I'll note, um, and it, was, it didn't show up on this PowerPoint, but um, the other just comment that I wanted to share is around the governance recommendation on the board of directors. We heard there was a lot of public comment around um, the board of directors, the uh, local service councils, things like that. So I just wanna lift that recommendation or that equity screen up as well. 
the working group understands that the RTD board is on par with other cities and that the revisions aren't necessarily going to happen at this time. Um, but in the future, there was something, um, there was some conversation around the working group around diversifying board membership. So demographically lived and professional experience, understanding and supporting transit. So really thinking about how does, um, how does a diverse board really show up potentially in the recommendation? Cause that will have equity um, considerations, um, especially making sure that the board is reflective of the communities that it serves. Um, and then the last just point on the governance is that continuing to explore the role that local service coordinating councils could play um, as potential decision making bodies since these are uh, at least um, these are reflective of the communities that they serve, which I think from an equity standpoint um, serves to, to achieve the outcomes that we were hoping. So I'll just pause there and I will stop sharing my screen and check in with Molly to see if she has anything else to add because this was her work um, and I don't want to be um, I don't want to take credit for her work. So Molly, as a member of the equity work group, anything else to add? We certainly deserve a lot of credit for convening us and for all of your contributions, Dea, um, within that working group and on this committee as a whole. Um, the only other thing I would add here is just the piece that's been weighing on me most is the, the conversation around local service councils. Um, just really wanting to be respectful of community members time who participate in that and making sure there's clear expectations and roles for them on, you know, what, you know, we've all served, I'm sure on an advisory board where it feels very advisory and you're not totally sure what kind of decision making authority you have or, or weight your, your group carries and it's not the best experience. So thinking about how do we get ahead of that from the start and make sure that it's really something um, that's adding value to the RTD system, um, as well as just thinking about the makeup of the board and any power dynamics um, between elected officials and community members. Just, you know, I know it's important for elected officials to be involved in, in these processes as well, but I think transit riders and, and community members really need to be the focus here. And so if um, those two groups are working together, just thinking about how do we set this up so it's something that's comfortable and approachable um, for those folks to be able to participate. Thank you, Molly. And that's it for us for the equity screens. Thank you, Dea. Thank you, Molly, uh, for all of your work. Um, this is, I'm excited that we um, committed to this equity lens and ultimately, though it sounds like we should have maybe uh, come to the conclusion sooner rather than later to have like a, you know, independent outside organization help with the, the full screening as opposed to kind of coming to that conclusion towards the end of our, our process, um, but clearly not too late um, for us to be able to get some some really good feedback. So I'm excited that we were, were able to um, implement, implement this um, and operationalize it just a little bit. Um, one thing I don't think we have discussed is, uh, you know, certainly this document in and of itself exists as guidance. These are all recommendations that as an advisory committee, we don't really have the ability to ensure happen. I think we're um, certainly have been collaborating with RTD and working um, to make these the most feasible, you know, but, um, you know, how do people engage with this kind of equity assessment? Are they able to engage with Maha Connects? Um, you know, after the fact, once we've, um, this accountability committee has been dissolved. So, you know, I'm not sure that's a specific question for any person, just something that, um, you know, thought I'd, I'd raise because I'm curious myself. Um, I do see two hands. <laughs> Elise, are you ready to uh, share your comments? Sure, I, I wanted to echo your, your um, comments of appreciation and excitement, I, I do think um, the committee was right to center equity. I think um, the, the process you all went through in providing equity assessments was a good one and could be a model. And uh, I just wanna acknowledge the, the work that went into that. And I wanna make sure that we're, um, as we go through the draft document that we're checking back in to see if we're responding to these equity concerns. And I did have one just out of curiosity question about one of your last comments, if it would be appropriate to ask, which is, um, I totally agree about diversifying the RTD board, but since they're an elected board, that's not typically something 
you know, the public gets to, to, to ultimately decide to who to vote for, but who get, who runs in the first place. And I was just curious if there was any um, solutions that, that surfaced when thinking about how to do that, whether or not that was causing you to go towards an appointed board with, with diversity categories outlined or some other solution that we hadn't thought of. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. And then of course, Molly, um, please feel free. I, I will say just as an observer of the committee or the working group, there was a lot of conversation and kind of brainstorming around what could be the potential. There was some conversation around um, a proposed kind of hybrid model that included elected and appointed, including like really clarifying um, the role of the appointed bodies. Cause of course that has a political that has political, um, that also has a political connotation associated with it. That was something the committee was very, or the working group, I should say, was really aware of. Um, I think one thing that also came out within the discussion is really not within the control of RTD, but just a, a broader system, systemic um, opportunity to really uh, support um, training programs and things that might support uh, folks that eventually want to step into the role of, of the board or at least run for the RTD board. So that was more of like a brainstorming kind of conversation, Not obviously not something within the control of RTD or even this committee, um, but just a couple of things that they discussed. Molly, I don't know if I missed anything. Yeah, I would just add this is something I think about with a variety of elected positions is, you know, how, how simple is it or how easy, what are the barriers for people who, you know, may work a non-traditional job or may need to work full time and have just a variety of, of responsibilities and um, you know, how do we eliminate some of those barriers so that more people have access to be able to serve in, in a position like that? Thanks. Good question, Elise. Um, Matthew, you have your hand raised. Yes, just wanted to remind the committee and state for the record that all of the equity assessments are included in the draft report, which we'll be discussing in the next agenda. Thank you for that reminder. Jackie. I put the question in the chat, but when we were when you were talking about um, private sector delivering service? And did you consider at all local governments as the potential partners for delivering the service? Because um, I think local governments, in addition to the private sector, are also potential partners there. And was that? Yeah, that was part of the conversation within the equity, the equity work group. Um, again, they were really focused on um, the definition and like, how do we just get really clear about what do we mean so that it could be broad enough to include um, local governments, nonprofit organizations, which I, I do remember we, we've, we had a lot of those conversations. So this may actually get us into the, the firming up the language and the recommendation piece, but how do we start to get a little bit clearer on those pieces? Um, that was certainly, I think, a, a pretty robust conversation that the work group had as well. Um, I had my hand raised, Crystal, and I, just wanted to also jump in and echo what Matthew shared. Um, the equity assessments are also within the recommendation, but as part of the conversation, just naturally other topics came up for consideration, um, which we went ahead and included as public comments um, in recognition that you know we're touching on a lot of things. Yes, we the group was convened to discuss equity and the equity assessments, but the conversation just naturally went um, in multiple different directions that we thought was going to be really we thought the comments should be reflected at least up for consideration by this committee because it, it, I mean, it was a really great conversation from my perspective, so. Thank you, Dea. Um, any other comments from the committee on this, um, on the equity assessments, recognizing that all of the prior conversations will also be kind of picked back up um, in the next item? Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for the robust discussion, some great questions, some great additional context um, on the equity assessment. Assessments, excuse me. Uh, so I, I think that transitioned us back to um, kind of the meat um, 
Well, I mean, to, I mean, honestly, this has been a really helpful conversation. I'm glad we've kind of dissected it bit by bit, but to kind of wrap it all up in um, agenda item eight, which is the formal discussion on the draft final report. Um, Matthew, did you wanna kick us off on this item? Sure. Um, so North Highland has drafted a report for your review, and we are going to go through that report with you. And I'll turn Thank it over to uh, Tanya from North Highland. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and um, my colleague Sarah will be doing the screen share here. Um, and if you could, sir, just quickly go to the um, introduction slide. Just want to talk a little bit about who's going to be um, kind of going through this conversation, to, or we'll start with agenda, sorry. Uh, we'll just quickly touch on um, who will be guiding this conversation today. We'll give you an overview of the draft final report, um, but really the crux of the conversation and what we want to talk about today are the uh, is having a, a discussion around those draft recommendations. And so as, uh, as Doug Rex said earlier, we'll be um, doing some, we'll be pulling up a document and accepting online edits um, for, for your comments. Um, and then we'll pivot back to the PowerPoint and uh, talk about next steps, including how to, to send additional comments and, and edits. Um, so if you could, Sarah, head on to the next slide. Um, so um, we are partnered with Matthew on this discussion today. Um, he and I will be largely uh, facilitating um, this, this conversation. And then we have Sarah, um, who's going to be um, you know, managing the screen for us, making edits and changes. And so um, please feel free, as we are at, at that portion, to, to ask for, you know, to scroll through the document or, or things. If, if, uh, if not everything is visible on the screen, some of these recommendations are a little bit lengthy. And so um, we were unable to get them in a format so that they could all be on one screen. So uh, we'll just need to be a little bit flexible with that. Um, so if you could, Sarah, go on to the next slide. Um, just want to orient you a bit to the document. Um, you know, we wanted to maintain a consistent appearance with the previous report. So you'll see that um, formatting and everything has, is, is uh, in line with the preliminary report. And we've really broken this down into three sections. Um, the first, you know, being a focus in on the recommendations. We wanted to make sure that the recommendations were up front, center, and easy to read and find. Um, and also um, wanted to highlight the importance of the equity assessments. So we put those into a second portion so that, you know, they, they remain up front and, 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 and central, central to, to what this committee um, has, has sought to achieve. And then finally, the third part um, are appendices. So that's some supplemental information to keep the um, overall document from being bogged down by a bunch of analysis and numbers and tables and charts and such. Um, but important information nonetheless. So I wanted to make sure that that was included in there. So Sarah, if you could move on to the next slide. So part one is you know, just an overview, uh, including an executive summary. Um, and the responsibilities of the, um, of the committee, um, which are reflective of the, of the scope of work that was agreed upon. We also highlight two important accomplishments of the committee um, in prior to, this, uh, to the final report, that being um, the proposed legislation recommendations that were signed off um, into law by, uh, by the governor in May, certainly a, a well-noted accomplishment and also highlighting the um, impact that um, the committee um, letter had to Senators Winter, Fen Fenberg, and Representatives uh, Gary and, and Garnett um, regarding the draft transportation funding proposal, where ultimately um, that, that resulted in a response from the bill sponsors indicating that funding for multimodal transportation options and road infrastructure would be expanded. Um, so, so some kudos for that, for sure. Um, and then um, the document part one includes the recommendations and they are grouped according to the scope, which you'll see the um, six, er I'm sorry, five scope areas there. You'll note that resource prioritization review and financial tracking were combined into one scope element because the recommendations for those particular scope areas really did overlap one another. Um, and so parsing those out did, did, not make a, did not make a lot of sense from a legibility perspective. Um, so if you could move on to the next, um, 
you know, you all just had a presentation on equity assessments, so we won't spend a, a lot of time here, but definitely did want to orient you to, to what was there and what that looked like. This is, um, as I said, its own part within the document to highlight, um, you know, all of the equity assessments that were done and elevating the importance of those equity assessments. And you see there in the draft, just a quick view of, of what that looks like. And then Sarah, if you could go to slide seven, which is the next slide. And then the appendices, um, we've got 10 of those here. Um, and really they support the, um, the information, the supplemental information, the analysis and, and any kind of reports that um, were done in, in support of those recommendations. Um, just a quick note here that item four and item seven, um, North Highland did provide rather extensive reports on that. In order to keep the document from being too bogged down, we provided a summary of those reports and then there'll be um, links on the RTD committee website for folks to get the full report. So um, we slim them down to about five, six pages each and then the, those full reports of 20 some odd pages um, will, will be available online uh, with a link in the document. So again, just really wanted to make sure that the document was streamlined with the focus on um, you know, the important recommendations and equity assessments that had been, that had been done. Um, and then if we can go to slide eight, you'll see, um, you know, we're, we're gonna hear pivot in just a minute to the actual um, recommendations and, and start making some changes there. But I um, wanted you to see how they were grouped, um, each of the recommendations under their scope heading. Um, and then kind of give you a peek of what that looks like in the document. So, you know, a little bit of introductory language that includes um, any links to supplemental information that should guide you to the proper place in the document for that, or um, in some cases to a web link of, of, of a report. Um, and then also a link to the equity assessment so that you're able to quickly navigate um, to that assessment for that particular recommendation. Um, so with that, I think, Matthew, we are ready to begin um, with our edits of the, of the recommendations themselves. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, and then we do have some um, yellow highlights for a few things that had come up during the, the last meeting on the 14th, make sure that we, we touch on those. Um, and then again, some other conversation that has stimulated today. So, um, so it should be a great conversation. Um, and with that, um, Matthew, I will I will turn it over to you. And you're on mute. Thank you, Tanya. Um, th uh, so um, I will note uh, these are the, um, the the COVID relief fund recommendations, uh, which are mostly unchanged since the ones that were um, uh, transmitted to RTD. I guess now several months ago or a few months ago. Uh, by the committee. I will note, uh, as Tanya said, there, there are some yellow highlights throughout uh, the, um, the, doc, the draft document right now. Um, I will note if you, if you move down the slide, there is one additional recommendation that was added um, after the transmittal to RTD. So that's the one that's highlighted. It's on um, essentially the, uh, it's a recommendation on the, on the LIV program on, on um, eligibility and uh, the process for eligibility uh, and, and making that uh, process perhaps a, a little bit uh, easier on um, on uh, clients and potential clients. So uh, with that, um, this is the first recommendation and see if there's any uh, discussion on any uh, potential changes. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, my um, recommendation on this is more on the intro that it's, it was a little bit confusing because we did an analysis of CARES funding. We wrote a letter on CRISA funding, but this recommendation is for all the federal stimulus funds of which we anticipate there'll be over 700 million. And that needs to be clear in the intro that this recommendation goes to that 700 million. And I think Staff had done some, uh, had provided some verbiage um, characterizing the full sh 
the full bucket of federal funds that I think would help at the beginning of this. I was also going to suggest a sentence that really highlights the importance of this of this set of recommendations because this these these unanticipated federal stimulus funds provides the most logical and readily available source of funding to implement our recommendations. And they're also very timely in, in terms of playing a role in restoring ridership from the pandemic. So I would also propose a strengthening sentence at, in the introduction to that effect as well. And I'm happy to provide language if that's useful or follow up with staff or whatever works. This sounds like something that we might want to do offline because it'll be uh, just adding uh, you know, uh, additional language to the beginning, but not necessarily changing any of the recommendations. So uh, staff can work with you offline uh, to get that updated. Assuming my committee members agree with the yeah, gist sure. of my comments. Of course. Do folks agree with those comments? I don't wanna, um, is silence acquiescence? I'm not sure. Okay with that. Silence is acquiescence, Elise. You know you'll hear from us if we don't like it, so. I, I in particular appreciate the acknowledging the larger pool of money at the beginning. I think that's really important. And at this point, we trust you, Elise. <laughs> hey, Rod, I'm not going like... that far. I'm not going that far, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> we trust, but verify. <laughs> How about that, Jackie? <laughs> okay, okay. Matthew, are you gonna keep us moving along in this conversation? Yep, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that uh, that um, that everyone had uh, an opportunity to to speak on this first one. No, yeah, I, I'm just clarifying. Sorry, not not to rush the conversation, but uh, I agree with what's been said thus far. Uh, Rex has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, Ma Matthew or Tanya, a question for you guys. Is it possible we can work from the actual draft document or maybe we're gonna do that later? I, I just I just wanna make sure that they're happy also with the kind of layout of the of the document itself because they will be that's what they will be finalizing. So I just I just wanna make sure there's an opportunity for that. Understood, certainly. And if you give me just a moment, Sarah, I'll send you a new link. I had, I had a question about that. I have a number of line edits, particularly to the non-recommendation portions of the intro. Is that something that we can, I, I'm happy to board people with that or just provide it directly to staff. I, I couldn't redline uh, the PDF. So um, I think we should talk about how we wanna capture that feedback as well. Thank you for that. And in fact, that, that is a discussion. I know we, we certainly want to capture um, the, that feedback that you have. Um, and we um, have in our next step slide how um, when to do that. But noting now that you have just the PDF, it might, um, and um, Matthew and, and, and other Dr. Cog staff um, maybe confirm, might make sense to provide the Word version of the document for ease of, of editing. Um, does that, does that seem like the right stuff there? You can do that. Okay. That makes right. sense. All right, and Sarah, you should have that link now. Sorry, Tanya, I was on mute. Um, I'm <laughs> putting, the, I'm pulling it up right now. Great.
can you see that now, Tanya? Yes, thank you. Um, and if you could uh, scroll to uh, COVID release starts on page 10. And it's down at the bottom, page 10. Okay. All right. Um, and then I think what we've heard here is that there are going to be some edits and that that is going to be taken offline, correct? Tanya, this is Doug. Uh, can I also ask if there were any comments up to this point in the document? And if so, I mean, clearly you can, we can take those offline, but we want to, you know, we need also need a mechanism, obviously, to get those comments back to everybody else on the committee too. But um, if there were specific comments that you had, at least I was just saying, if there were, I was just asking if there were specific comments people had up to this point in the document. Um, and it sounds like you may have some, Elise, and I, I don't know if there's anything in particular you want to bring up now or just provide the staff that we can then share with the full group. Well, I, I did actually have a sort of a bigger uh, paragraph that I thought was missing in the intro, which talks about um, we're a recommendation making body, but RTD is required to respond within a certain number of days and that um, we would be following up with a face-to-face -face meeting to hear about any recommendations they're not gonna implement. And there was also um, a suggestion from, I think it was a member of the MCC to us about um, su suggesting to RTD a timeline for implementation, which I thought was pretty good. And I think people thought it was a good idea. And I would include that recommendation on implementation timeline in that paragraph that doesn't exist, but, but I think should. And that's in the um, the uh, sort of intro of how we were set up and what our direction was and that kind of stuff. So I don't know what folks think about that. I think it sounds great. I have no objection. You're, you're muted, Elise. Sorry, my, my daughter has strep throat. We're trying to figure out how to do a teleconference at the same time I'm doing this. I was talking to her. <laughs> Okay. I, um, sorry, I just want to jump in really quick, Crystal. Um, I guess I, I just have a question. Would we include that within the executive summary or the overview? Mm. Which based on, I guess, what, what you shared, Elise, it seems like it might make more sense in the overview as just like a um, kind of a tie, but then if, if put a bow on that, but then again, if we can reference it maybe at the end of the document, um, the timeline, um, just to be really clear, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I do too. And if if Elise, you have specific language um, you'd like to put in there, just let us know. And, and the, the version, you know, the committee will get an updated version, which will show the red line changes between this version and the so-called draft final. So just FYI. So Sarah, if you could there um, at the end of the overview, um, just make another paragraph and just um, put placeholder for now. And um, we'll refer to um, timeline um, for RTD response and implementation. But we we um, we do have a slide to discuss a, a timeline uh, coming up. So we we did hear the committee um, at the last meeting. So we 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 do have we have designated some some time to discuss that. I have a comment on page eight. We're ready to move to there. I think it's important to note in meeting structure that all the meetings were virtual. Um, part of the reason that's important is I, I think that's actually uh, increases accessibility of these meetings that the, you know, the link to join them 
um, and listen in was on the Dr. Cog web public website. Um, you didn't have to travel to a meeting and, and sit there in person, um, which I think at least we found within CDOT has really helped uh, increase participation. So I, I would suggest that as an ad. I think that's great, Rebecca. And quite frankly, I don't know if we could have had seven meetings a month if they weren't virtual. <laughs> yeah. Great. Sarah, could you go ahead and similarly add a, a placeholder so we can draft that language? And could I, I, I guess I, ha, I do have uh, suggested changes throughout all this. Like nobody cares that the meetings were held on the second Monday and that we moved them for holidays. That's detail that is not um, d does not provide meaning. I think saying the full committee met monthly would be adequate to that. That's the first sentence under meeting structure. It just, it, when we add detail that's not helpful, it, it, it um, I think dilutes the impact of the, re the report. Does that make sense? It does, yes. And we'll clean that language up, but uh, won't won't leave you here to to see the tediousness of that. And and if we're going to go through this paragraph by paragraph by paragraph, and I apologize, I would move us back to page five. I had three hours on a plane yesterday, and I went through each one. Um, in the second sentence where it says RTD helps reduce transportation related climate emissions. And, that's, and then it has a, so important to the quality of the environment along the front range. Um, we need to add the words and air pollution. Air pollution is important to, to the quality of the, the life on the front range. Climate impacts the entire state and the planet. And so I think that's what the, the missing words there. Ozone is a big damn deal on the front range and transportation is related to that. So I would add the words and air pollution so that the clause is, is about that. Great, thank you. Any other, any other comments on this particular page? Yes, sorry. Please. Um, the, I feel like the missing sentence in the executive summary there is we don't mention at all the fact that RTD is having an you know, unsustainable and insufficient financial um, challenge there, which really is one of the big reasons this committee was formed. Um, and I'm so I don't know if committee members agree, but I feel like that's the intro is more like the world's changing. It's RTD was having, is having specific issues and this committee was created to address those. And I'm thinking of a, a sentence somewhere along the lines of RTD is also experiencing lackluster ridership and financial challenges exacerbated by a heavy debt load and unsustainable revenue outlook or something like that as the um, sentence, um, in the last, the last sentence of the first paragraph that talks about our formation back up. We talk about the re region's transit system must also increasingly, I would add a sentence saying an RTD is, a, is facing these challenges as well. If I could add to that, Elise, uh, the other thing that I think when the committee was, was conceived uh, nobody realized what a big thing this pandemic was going to be. That's true. How much that really would have such a huge impact, both on the state's economy, but also in the economy of, of uh, RTD. I don't know. So how that, that in, I think that's true. Um, we could add something as well. I'm going to put the, the, the sentence I was suggesting to include in the chat. I wasn't Right. suggesting the words that you put on the page. That was my. Right. And Brett, if you had specific language around COVID. 
Yeah. Um, just, just that when, you know, when we were assigned our duties and things like that, when the committee was originally formed, I don't think that we, we really could, could see just how much of a factor that was going to be. I mean, it just destroyed uh, ridership for one thing. I don't know how to put that in sentence in here without thinking. I don't write, I don't write well <laughs> remotely in, in this format. I'm also concerned about the fact that we're down to about 35 minutes left in this meeting. And there's a heck of a lot we haven't gotten to. That's a really good point, Rhett. Um, I, I think this, um, well, we, I, I think it'd be good to pause just for a second. And I guess just talk about how we want to move forward. There's several dozen more pages um, aside from the what's in the appendix. So I didn't include that, that we could go kind of line by line with edits or kind of just high level, maybe place markers or where we might want to um, uh, address some things without talking about the specific language. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pausing and I would love a discussion on how you all want to move forward since this is you know, it's meant to be a discussion for all of us. How how do you guys want to spend the next 30-ish minutes um, editing this draft? It seems like we're going to get red lines of things people have added or, or everybody's going to have the opportunity to do their edits with tracking and Word. Then we'll be able to sort of see how all this fits together or doesn't. I think it's going to, it's hard to do that this way, I think, and, and not a lot of time. What about, I agree with you, Rhett. What, what about going to big picture changes to any recommendations yeah. and then allow line edits to be submitted um, that we can all view? And if we, you know, folks aren't in agreement, then we can address that um, exactly. you know, at the next meeting. Right. I, I like that as well. Any, any objection to that? So okay. If I could, the one thing is I don't think I have it in this form to be able to. I don't know why I'm doing something wrong. They're talking about converting this to Word and sending it back out to us. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, because nobody has the ability to do line edits now except for them. Yeah. And if we get all, if when you're making changes, just track. Make sure you're tracking with your name associated with those ed edits, because there's going to be some overlap when everybody gets through doing theirs. Right, then um, I will coordinate with Matthew on getting this word version to, to you all. Um, so I think, Sarah, that takes us to the next recommendation, it, which is the um, beginning on page 12. I, I have a question, and that is, is there a way that this that could be one document that everybody could uh, use to review the comments of others and those red lines and they could say, I'm fine with that. And rather than possibly us all looking at several different documents, or was that what was being proposed? It's it certainly there, there are tools out there from Google to Word that everybody can do editing on shared documents. So it's, it's really, I think that would be a, the best route if we can get there. I mean, I realize it may require a little learning curve. Um, Matthew, um, do you, would you like to, I, I have a few ideas. Um, maybe you and I can connect on, um, on, on how to go about doing that. Yep, sounds good. Okay, I, 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 I appreciate the sentiment there um, and, and definitely think it's, it's worth you all seeing all changes that you all are making. So, um, well, I'll connect with Matthew and, and we'll, we'll work that out. Um, before, before getting back into the recommendations, however, I just wanna pause and see if there's any other, any other questions we should address before, before moving into the recommendations again. All right, great. So um, the next recommendation is um, about improving operator retention. Um, and just wanna pause and see if there was any feedback from the committee, anything that they would might like to um, see changed here. Or if, 
Yes. I, I'm sorry. I see. Uh, uh, well, I noticed in, in the, uh, the public uh, survey or feedback poll, whatever you want to call it, that there, was, uh, there were some comments about you know, looking at compensation. Um, I, I know that there was the state auditor's report that said that you know, supervisors needed to treat bus operators with respect and so forth. Those are all good recommendations, but in terms of recruitment and retention, what we're finding at the Long Fort Transportation Authority is that uh, costs are really going up. The cost of housing is going up, the cost of fuel, food, services, and so forth. And uh, so we reopened our collective bargaining agreement uh, six months early so that we could bump up our pay to make us more attractive for uh, people that we're trying to recruit. And we've seen a lot of turnover as well because there are a lot of jobs out there currently. It may be a little bit late in the game to add something like that, but uh, I, I really think it's going to be important, if not uh, essential for RTD to have the flexibility to perhaps uh, take a look at its compensation for all of its employees uh, to fill the void as far as uh, their staffing levels are concerned. Otherwise, it's going to be really challenging for them to staff up, to expand their services, to accommodate more riders. Uh, and maybe they're already doing that, but that seems to be something that's missing here. And, and I can put my comments in this uh, document and, and, and people can uh, provide their feedback at that time. Okay. Any other Comments, feedback on operator retention? Yeah, I have one. That, that last bullet there, RTD management should improve its processes for assigning schedules to operators. Um, it, that seems of, of limited uh, helpfulness without sort of noting what the problem is. And not being on this subcommittee, I, I don't know what the problem was myself. So maybe it's very clear to RTD, but I, I would suggest uh, adding some additional text there to just know what we're solving for or what should be solved for. If I recall, the, part of the issue there, Rebecca, was that uh, it's it's seniority based. So the mm -hmm. senior, more senior people get to make all, all the choices to what schedules they want. But a lot of the job losses were with new early, newly hired employees and they got the worst possible schedules, which wasn't necessarily the most equitable way to hang on to those new employees. Is that yeah. approximately right, Lynn? Do you remember that issue? Yeah, uh, I, I think, you know, that that's approximately true. Uh, uh, others could speak more specifically, but that's all controlled by the CBA, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it, I don't think those decisions are, are unilateral. If I may add something to that for sake of clarity, basically what it was stating in the audit was that there was high turnover rate uh, due to the span of people being on extra board and to the point that was just raised, keeping in mind this is seniority based and they bid according to seniority, there are individuals that, uh, that enjoy being on extra board. And the recommendation was saying, could we make the schedules more equitable? That's the point you all raised, but recognizing that it's represented work and it's done by seniority based, there is, some limitations in relationship to what needs to be done because there is some percentage of our workforce that enjoy the flexibility with being on an extra board as, a, as opposed to having an assigned route. And in all of these issues, you know, RTD is going to come back to us and respond. And so, you know, I, I don't think we can solve a lot of the management problems at that level or management challenges at that level. Uh, and, and Deborah and others are certainly better positioned to, to, to try to address it. I think what we're doing here is just saying that this is a, this is a, a problem and just recognizing that. 
and that's worthwhile. Are we ready to move on to the next recommendation, which is service council? And if you want to go ahead, um, Sarah, and drop below to actually see the language. Um, have you, I think I'm going to turn it over to you and of notes for this one from a previous conversation um, under membership item two, of, uh, there was a question related to elective elected representatives um, as, as serving on the membership of these councils. And um, it was something that was brought up last evening. So Matthew, I'll, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, Tana, Tanya. Um, yeah, I was just about to note that. Um, so uh, this was the recommendations related to the sub-regional service councils, uh, the committee will recall that we had several round table discussions with various stakeholders on this topic and happy to hear any input that you have uh, for any uh, potential changes to this recommendation. If I can just jump in, um, I think one thing that we heard in the public comments, but also within the equity is that I don't know that we fully addressed as a committee is the first line around membership and having elected officials engage as part of this, part of this sub-regional service councils, just, uh, I, I would be okay with removing that, just again, and lifting up the power dynamics that I think were lift, that were mentioned by some of the, the equity groups um, and just an acknowledgement that elected officials may have other opportunities to engage in this way. But I, I also just acknowledge that's, that's my perspective. So I don't know if others, I could be swayed, but I, I do just wanna be mindful of like the power dynamics that might might inadvertently come up by having elected officials on it in a table that should really be focused on um, service delivery and service delivery within a specific within communities, I should say. So Dad, oh, go, oh, go ahead, go ahead Jackie. Oh, well, I was just going to say, I feel like um, I hear a lot from just not just my community, but surrounding communities in my capacity as an elected official. And I'm, I think that that input is important. So I, folks from Highlands Ranch call me to talk about what they would like to see happen at RTD. And I'm not sure why they're calling me, but, but I hear it. And so I guess that there is value brought by the elected official in the sense that they hear from disparate groups within their community and beyond. So I don't wanna lose that, but I very much appreciate the point that you're trying to elevate as well. Would it be worthwhile to say something like elected official or their designated represent representee? Um, and we could just broaden it that way uh, because I can absolutely also envision there is a transit champion in my community who is just in this and, and, and interacting with folks and they would be the best. So would, would, it, would that tweak maybe address it? I think so. Again, I, I just want to lift up what I what I consistently hear from folks, um, and, and the way it reads, it seems like it is just it is narrowed in on an elected official. But even if we can broaden it to say that or their designee, which could be either a staff member or a transit advocate or someone else, I think might help with some of the power dynamics. I could live with that. I. I, I the one reason that I didn't want to lose track of a local community representative is that one of the models being held up is Dr. Cog's subregional forums. And truthfully, I, you know, I sat on one, and I'd like to think I my contribution was valuable, but truthfully, my subject matter expert staff person who could spout off the ridership in various routes and and explain why this route should go faster, you know, go with higher frequencies than another was far more valuable. 
Um, and the main thing is for to have a community representative that has some subject matter expertise in the local transit system. So I think maybe that's a good compromise. Well, it, it would seem that, um, you know, what is the role of the elected official on, uh, on this council? And how many are there? Uh, will they dominate or is this going to be a group of 10 people and we're talking about one elected official? I don't, I don't think if, if the balance is right that they would necessarily uh, you know, uh, be in charge of, of the group or uh, unduly influence it. But I do think it's important to have elected official participation in these communities because they're partners and they can bring a lot to the table as well. One observation is, is that we're not gonna get this thing right the first time we do it. It's gonna take some iteration and we're gonna to have to sort of figure out what's working, what's not working. So I, I think, again, these are recommendations. Uh, if, we, if we try to get too far in the weeds in terms of how we specified, I think we'll get in trouble. But, but I, do, I do like this change to or their designee because as Lee said, in, and I think Jackie said this too, there are people that they know that would be perfect for this. And, and they're usually kind of busy running their, you know, the city and counties that they're representing, that they're elected from. So I think it's just gonna take some iteration and some uh, thoughtful consideration of the issues that Daya raised. I like the flow of conversation. I did also want to acknowledge that we had um, folks who were raising their hands um, uh, as well. I, I wanted to give um, them the opportunity. I saw that Kristen um, has her hand up now, and I think there was one other person. I think Julie did as well. I'm going to jump in, Crystal. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that adding com community, how do I say this? Community represent representation needs to be a big part of the membership. And members of the community are not going to be willing to go through the election process. It's going to be more of a, I'm going to show up to the meeting and I want my voice to be heard. That needs to be a real, a really important part of the membership for these sub-regional uh, committees. Thanks, Kristen. Julie, did you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I really just wanted to uh, agree with a lot of the conversation that was happening and, and maybe even suggest for bullet one, instead of elected, say community representatives, but then put in parentheses, unelected elective representatives or the designee. So as an elected official for me, I want to be part of this process. It's not because I want to lead it or to, to structure it in a specific way. It's because it's my job um, to listen to community and then take that and, and influence other areas. So for example, um, as uh, you know, the Dr. Cog director, I want to take that feedback to Dr. Cog. As the NADA, which is our North Area Transportation Alliance, as a NADA representative, I want to take that information back to NADA. So I have uh, the responsibility to take that information and, and place it out elsewhere in my influence. And so um, I think that it's important to have um, you know, the community voice be able to come through and not necessarily just what my opinions are, um, but just recognize that electeds do have a role to play in, in how um, we could carry on um, that information to the other spheres of influence that we have. Julie, um, I just wanna add on and expand on your, your comments as well. I put in the chat just a, a thought to consider similar to what we've experienced in this committee with our RTD members being ex officio members, um, uh, you know, being part of it um, in that engaged and involved in that way um, and directing that first line instead of naming elected officials, broadening it out to capture some of the other thoughts as well. So, I mean, I don't know if there is a right or wrong way. I'm, I'm a little indifferent only because I do think that 
I, I want to make space for the concerns I've heard as well um, in terms of the disparate um, power dynamics, the potential disparate dy uh, power dynamics, as well as the, the kind of practical nature of decision making and an elected body and representation in that way. Um, so I would just offer that as an alternative structure. You know, maybe there's more than one recommendation or options that we include in this um, uh, final report, but could be something to think about as well. Go ahead, Jackie. Okay, I, um, I, I would suggest, I, I do think it's important that electeds be identified only in the sense that the staff is the one that's, their staffs are gonna be probably a lot of the folks that are actually doing the work. So to, and, and without them, the work is, is not gonna be done really. I, it's just be honest. And so we need the electeds there. And I think you do need to call it out. I'm just gonna say it, but uh, they, or their designee and likely uh, as was raised, it's gonna be a potential staff person. But I really think um, that community interests need to be there as well because they're really the drivers, but we need the electeds to then have the uh, uh, structure behind to get it done. So I would suggest you do leave electeds or their designee and maybe just add the word community uh, in front of the broad, the, the next one, right? Uh, a, a, a broad spectrum of community interests and geography. I think, <clears throat> I think we can't absolutely expect to get everything in the first bullet. And let's remember there's two other bullets following it that, that can speak to other groups or interests. So that's, I, I do wanna leave the word elected in or their designee. I wanna add that though. Uh, Lynn, did you wanna chime in? Just quickly, this is, this is one area that the board has had a, um, uh, discussion on a more extensive than some of the others early on. We'll be obviously looking at all of these in more detail. And we submitted some comments that haven't been included here, but we'll get, bring those back in the future. But um, I think, you know, one, we, the sense was that various different areas might create this differently. It might uh, Some might focus more on the local coordinating councils, uh, the TMOs. There are a lot of voices here that um, I think are important to be included, but you know, I sort of agree with someone who said, you know, having subject matter experts is important. Having the writers is very important, but it's, um, that is included here. Uh, so um, I think that, that uh, some of the suggestions about electives um, or, you know, the community representatives are good, but I, I think that, uh, that some of this remains to be fleshed out. So is this an item that we might have more red line changes or proposals um, offline? Um, kind of feels that there isn't a clear direction and we are kind of getting into the weeds of editing the, the text at this point. So um, can, you know, we have 11 more minutes in the conversation. Um, would it be okay if we wrapped up the conversation as is and just try to work offline to come at some resolution to this or did we want to try to finalize this before we moved on to the next item? I think we need to move on. I think we, in our final meeting, there may be some decision points where sure. we have to vote on and this could be one of them, but okay. let's see if we can, how far we can get with red lines. I also made a suggestion in the chat for another edit in this section, which I don't think is as controversial. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, that said, we do have six other recommendations to go through and we have 10 minutes. So I suppose I'll, I'll ask um, Madam, Madam Co-Chair, would you prefer the rest of these um, edits and review of the recommendations also be handled in red line form offline? Well, let me ask the, the group. Um, I feel like with 11 minutes, we might just want to high level finish out this um, category of recommendation, but that's just my inclination. 
Um, what are your, are you guys comfortable with that? Um, trying to accomplish, like wrap a bow. I think that's the terminology that my co-chair uses <laughs> um, on this one particular category of recommendations. Seeing a net head nod. The only more structural the only formatting that. change that I'd like to bring up just before we leave the before the meeting ends. On um, sorry, Rebecca, did you say it specifically on this like category recommendations or no. just structurally overall? Yeah. Okay. Um, Julie, what were you gonna say? Um, I was just gonna say if if there are time if there is time for just a little bit of discussion, I'd be interested to hear what some of the changes um, that people wanted to propose for the Northwest Rail and Unfinished Fast Tracks Corridor, because I know that I've gotten some feedback on that too. And just curious if there's going to be any larger changes to that section that people wanted to propose. Okay, so I think with all of that in consideration, let's um, pause. Rebecca, I'd like to hear your overall structural comments and see how we do on time after that. So it, um, it's not a huge change, but I guess somebody just asked the question of, of perhaps Tanya. It seems to me the financial review piece should be nested under the resource prioritization review and financial stability. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of curious why it was separated. And part of the reason I think it should be part of the story was a, a comment um, Elise made earlier that the significant amount of COVID funding that RTD has received is sort of part of the overall financial picture and stability of, of the agency, both in the short term and, and possibly in the long term. And to kind of pull it towards the beginning and disconnect it from the larger financial piece. I don't know that I quite agree with that, but I also don't know what the, the logic was to put it as it is now. Sure, happy, happy to explain the logic and, and come up with a solution here. So um, one of the committee's responsibilities was directly to spend the COVID-19 relief funding in the scope. Um, and so that's how that financial review kind of came out by itself. Um, as well, it, it was, um, oh, I'm looking for the actual language here. Um, but it, it was, um, here we go. Uh, recent financials from the district, including any recent audits and a thorough review of the agency use of CARES Act stimulus fund. So that's sort of the overall financial review and, and we incorporated that with the performance audit from um, the, the state auditor. Um, if, if it, so we can either, we can move it to the other financial review, the other financial section or move that financial section up to directly follow the, um, the financial review section. It'd be my preference to have it all together, um, but I, I would love to hear from Rut in particular or any others that have a different perspective here. Yeah, the, the, one of the challenges in all the COVID funding, I mean, we saw this massive amount of money coming out of the federal government and we have all these other needs uh, that we, we talk about in terms of Northwest Rail and other unfinished corridors, but there's a lot of specificity in all those federal grants as to where that money could be used. And so, uh, it, it's, it was pretty hard to figure out how to pry much out of that. Now, the next round of, of uh, funds, that may be a different situation. I, I really don't know. I don't think any of us know. It's still being written uh, right now. So, I mean, we're, I, don't, I don't know what the impact uh, is going to be of trying to figure out how we would move that around. To, to me, I mean, I, I tried to address some of the issues of the amount of debt that RTD is carrying and, and the amount, you know, everybody thinks, well, the sales tax revenues pay for all the operations and everything else. They're going to debt just to cover the debt for the most part. And so, so I think that, that one, of, one of the biggest things I worry about is the financial sustainability of, of RTD in a situation where it has so much of its, of its income already committed to either operating what they've already built or paying the debt on what they've already built, at least on the fast track side. And it, it's, it's hard for me to, I would not want to be in a position of responsibility on that 
uh, it, it's just a tough problem. It's hard to balance that budget. All right, I wonder if maybe we can help make that connection for the reader because you could look at this and say, oh, the RTDs received 700 odd million. I think that's one of the changes we talked about, but the full, so the full amount of the COVID funds and, and just to better explain why that helps in the short term, but perhaps not in the long term. Because yeah. if, I, if I was new to this, I would say, wow, that's a lot of money. And why doesn't that help RTD's overall financial picture? I don't think we explain that. I don't think, I don't think, well, I think where it's discussed is buried further down where a lot of people are not gonna get to. Yeah. And so I think your point, Rebecca, is a good one. Um, and I'm happy to suggest text, but. That would be good. Uh, the, the other thing about that is it would be good to have that text in both places. There's no reason why it has to be just in one place. And so you might look at what's said further down and figure out how that could come up into that, into that earlier point so that people understand you know, one of our big responsibilities was financial sustainability of RTD. And boy, that that's a hard one to do with a committee that has, can only recommend. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I think that's a point well taken. I think some agreement in the chat. Um, will you two work offline to um, try to incorporate that um, unless anyone has any objections to that? Okay. Rebecca, if you'd like, you can do the first cut of it and send it to me and I'll get back to you and we'll massage it till we feel like it's comfortable. Great. Okay. Um, we have a couple of minutes. We might run over a few. My apologies. Julie, um, did you want to just ask your question uh, high level on, on that portion of the report? Well, and, and really it was just to kind of gauge um, what were some of the edits that people wanted to do in here. One of the feedback that I got from um, a, a member of my NATO group was just uh, specifically on bullet three or just in general, really trying to be more aggressive um, with the words here about, you know, how is RTD working on, um, sorry, I'm on page 17. If, oh, well, you're on a different document. Okay, all right. Um, how can RTD be more, um, I don't know, um, I don't, I, stronger language around finding um, other resources um, for this option. And then just in general, I wanted to see um, what other people were thinking about throwing out specifically for this recommendation, since it's such an important, you know, and, and touchy topic for a lot of people. It is now. <laughs> I'm happy to say what I was thinking. Um, I was thinking uh, that we, under number four, where on the part that's not bolded, if you could keep scrolling down, I would move that to number five. Don't do it. I'm just saying that's what I would do. Just and if you could scroll down. Um, and get rid of stop number five after the bolded text and just send people include the 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 paragraph from four and then reference the appendix as a possible um compromise but not include the the text under five this was i think the recommendation of the mcc to to delete number six which is now number five um and, you know, I want to honor Rhett's good work and analysis that he did on a lot of this. And I, I think ultimately it is the decision of the region what to do on this issue in conversation with RTD after the updated numbers come out. <clears throat> Rhett raises a lot of important issues in, in his analysis. So I, I, I want to honor that by keeping it in the appendices, but I wouldn't include that language um, in number five. Is there any, um, without going into specific edits, any other 
types of recommendations, um, I guess, different than what Elise and Julie have mentioned on this particular item that we wanna um, just communicate with the group. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're at 1031, um, just a little bit over time. Um, wanna just offer one last opportunity for comment from the group um, if, if needed. Um, I think we, we haven't obviously been able to go through each one, but it sounds like um, we'll get the Word document version of this. We'll be able to kind of, we'll have a forum where we can see the collective edits being proposed by the committee in the different sections. And um, what will we need to have accomplished before our next meeting and what will we accomplish during our next meeting? And I think that's a um, question for Dr. Cog, I believe. Um, would just love to just get some understanding of and clarity for the group of how we're directing our time and energy before and during our next conversation. Madam Chair, we will, uh, I will uh, work with North Highland staff and we will get out uh, a red line uh, document uh, to the committee. Uh, I think we're going to propose a, a quick turnaround on that so that we can get everything ready for the next meeting on the, uh, I believe the 11th or 12th, I'm not looking at my calendar, but um, in two weeks. Um, so uh, we will send out an email uh, with the uh, opportunity to, to redline this document and uh, give you a, a due date for it. Matthew, is that gonna be in a Google form so we can see other people's edits? Uh, some kind of form like that. We will, we will figure out how to, how to do that and, and send it out to you so that uh, you can share probably something Google or we will figure that out. Okay. And what's our deadline for getting those edits in? It's probably going to be a pretty quick turnaround, like uh, July 1st. Okay. I, I don't know, Matthew. I think we've got a bit of time here. I think we can, if we can get, I mean, I think we got to be realistic too. I think we can get them by Friday, um, you know, knowing that there's a holiday on Monday that are, mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks will I mean, we can get the document back out to people on Tuesday. Okay. That sounds like a good way to move forward. Uh, we've had some folks had to jump off. So one last comment uh, or opportunity for any last minute pressing um, comments to share with the committee. Thanks everybody for the effort you're putting in this. We're in the home stretch, this last little bit of effort will make the big difference. So thank you, hang in there, keep the, those, those ideas coming and, and we're gonna have some great recommendations when we're through this. That was indeed pressing, your pep talk. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much. Um, apologies for going over and we will see you all at our next meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ever.